Six Flags Over Texas and Six Flags Fiesta Texas are two of the most well-known amusement parks in the United States, as well as two of the most popular parks in the Six Flags chain. Six Flags Over Texas was the original Six Flags Park, and it has been able to build and grow as the years go by. The same can be said for Fiesta Texas, which was purchased by the company at a later time, but has since grown to be one of the best Six Flags parks. These two parks are located in the same state, and are built near larger cities that they are associated with. Arlington has Six Flags Over Texas, and San Antonio has Fiesta Texas. But what about Houston? Both of these parks are a three-hour drive away from Houston, and why is such a large city without a large amusement venue near it? Well, it wasn't always that way, and Houston once had a world all its own, with attractions that could not be found anywhere else. It's time for us to venture one more time back into Astro World. It started with one man's idea. Roy Hofheinz was a judge of Houston who had also served as the city's mayor. He held the distinction of being the youngest judge in the city's history, but he had ambition and a slew of new ideas for the city. Hofheinz found success in bringing Major League Baseball to Houston, and he personally oversaw the construction of the Astrodome, which was a multi-purpose stadium that could be used for a variety of events. The Astrodome was the beginning of a plan to bring new forms of entertainment to Houston, and among these plans was an idea for an amusement park. Hofheinz consulted with staff at both Disneyland and Six Flags Over Texas so as to avoid any issues that may have occurred during the opening of those parks. When construction began on the new park in 1967, Hofheinz noted that the humid weather of Texas would likely impact families' enjoyment of the park. As such, he undertook the bold task of organizing the installation of more than 2,000 tons of central air conditioning into the park. The vents were kept underground which helped with cooling, and the air would be blown into shaded areas, queue lines, and walkways. A bridge was constructed crossing the 610 highway loop, connecting the park to the Astrodome's parking lot, which the two venues shared. A monorail system was even planned to shuttle guests between the park, the Astrodome, and the park's hotel, but it was never built. One year after construction began, Hofheinz himself and his children personally cut the tape to open his new park, Astro World. The park's name, as well as the Astrodome, was a tribute to the Johnson Space Center, which opened in Houston in 1965. June 1, 1968 was the day when the public were officially let into Astro World, and the park opened to great success. Much of this success can be credited toward the incorporation of the air conditioning throughout the park, which helped people stay much more comfortable under the hot Texas sun. The air conditioning was not the only cause of success, though, as Astroworld opened with a number of impressive attractions. Astroworld had plenty of rides that were geared toward families and riders of all ages, the first of which was the Astro Wheel, a Ferris wheel that was themed to futuristic technology. Also of note was the Mill Pond, which featured bumper cars on water. Another popular water attraction was the Rio Mysterio, which was a jungle boat cruise. Along the way, riders would encounter many animals, and the boats were, of course, air-conditioned. The tallest attraction at the park was the Astro Needle, which was an observation deck that took riders up for a breathtaking view of Houston's skyline. Also featured at the park was a train that shuttled guests around the park, as well as a sky ride that could take guests from one end of the park to the other. Of all these attractions, the most popular ride on opening day was the Alpine Sleigh Ride. The sleigh ride was an ambitious coaster that was constructed inside a giant man-made mountain. The air conditioning installed throughout the park was put to great use as riders rode through a recreation of the Swiss Alps with frequent appearances by the abominable snowman. The similarities between the sleigh ride and the Matterhorn bobsleds at Disneyland are evident, and it is likely Hofheinz was inspired to construct the ride based on the success of the version at Disneyland. The Alpine sleigh ride did have some technical issues on opening day, including the chilled air inside the mountain not working properly, although this issue was corrected soon after the park's opening. Despite a few small issues, children and adults alike raved about Astro World, and the park welcomed 50,000 people in its first weekend alone. Those standing on top of the Astro Needle may have noticed that there was plenty of empty land surrounding the park, and as such, Astro World had plenty of room to grow, and grow it did. As the year 1970 came around, Astroworld opened Fun Island, a smaller area adjacent to the park that featured rides of its own. The first of these new rides was the Swamp Buggy, a small roller coaster by Chance Rides that seemed to twist and spiral around an empty tree trunk. Fun Island also included the Wacky Shack, a funhouse walkthrough attraction where it appeared as though gravity had been tilted sideways. By this time, the park had also opened a new coaster. Known as the Serpent, 
This small coaster was built by Aerodynamics. Since it was such a small coaster, families and small children could ride, and its low speed of 14 miles per hour ensured that no one would get too scared. Serpent curved its way past trees and foliage next to the park's pond, and was another great addition to the rapidly growing park. The Oriental section of Astroworld received a new addition as well during this time with the Bamboo Shoot Log Flume Ride. In keeping with the Oriental theme of that section of the park, the ride featured structures reminiscent of Chinese architecture, and it was themed to a log floating through a bamboo forest. Astroworld now had a good collection of flat rides, two small children's coasters, and a log flume ride. However, there were still a few things missing from the otherwise well-rounded park. Astroworld was well on its way to becoming a world-class park, but it needed a mascot to do shows in the park's children's area. To meet this demand, the park introduced Marvel McFay and his Enchanted Animals, an original show featuring a cast of animals as its characters. The main character of the show was Marvel McFay, a gypsy man who had magical powers. The characters were designed by Raleigh Crump, a former Disney Imagineer who is known for his work on some of the famous attractions at Disneyland, including the Haunted Mansion. The show was a hit with kids and adults, and its success can be credited toward the catchy music that played during each show. Marvel McFay had his own theme song, which was written and professionally recorded specifically for Astro World. The song likely remained in the heads of the kids and their parents who heard it during their visits to the park. Today, a magical day. Marvel McFay. While the children could enjoy themselves at Marvel McFay's show, teenagers and adults were able to board the park's first major roller coaster, the Dexter Freebush Electric Roller Ride. This was an aerodynamics mine train coaster that was notable for being the first ride of its kind to use steel supports. With a drop of 80 feet and a top speed of 46 miles per hour, the electric roller ride might not sound like much today, but when it opened, it was considered one of the most thrilling coasters of its kind. The ride featured many sharp turns and even a few moments of airtime, and its duration of just under three minutes meant that riders got quite a lengthy ride experience. In 1973, following the opening of the electric roller ride, the Swamp Buggy Coaster was removed from Fun Island. By this time, Astroworld had grown into a destination for both families and those seeking thrilling rides, and the coming years were looking bright. The residents of Houston were unaware, though, of some major changes that would be coming to the park. Astroworld underwent a major change of hands in 1975 when it was leased to the Six Flags Company, which had already found success operating their first park, Six Flags Over Texas. Part of the lease agreement was an option to purchase the park, and the company did just that in the same year. The park was now advertised as Astroworld, a member of the Six Flags family. This marketing strategy helped to set it apart from the company's other parks and show that Astroworld was still the same park that citizens of Houston had been attending for years. Right after Six Flags took ownership, there were talks of a new section to be created in the park, themed after Coney Island in New York City. A wooden roller coaster was planned to be the centerpiece of this new area, and the park's manager's original plan was to relocate the famous Coney Island Cyclone, which was in a state of disrepair at the time, to Astroworld. However, upon further investigation, the cost to relocate the famous coaster was just too high, and it was decided instead that Six Flags would build their own mirror image version of the Cyclone. Six Flags commissioned famed coaster designer William Cobb to design the new coaster, which would be taller and faster than the original Cyclone. Construction took longer than anticipated due to a tropical storm causing significant damage to the north end of the coaster. Despite the delay, the Texas Cyclone opened to the public in 1976 and quickly became one of the top roller coasters in the country. The ride featured an 80-foot drop at a speed of 64 miles per hour, which made for a thrilling experience that definitely topped the electric roller ride, previously the only large coaster in the park. As the years passed, the Texas Cyclone received new trains manufactured by D.H. Morgan Manufacturing. These trains were almost universally disliked by riders due to the large headrests preventing riders from seeing anything that was not directly in front of them. Eventually, the headrests were removed, and many considered the ride much more enjoyable as a result. Astroworld continued adding more coasters to the park in 1978, 
with the opening of Greased Lightning, the park's first looping coaster. This ride was a Schwarzkopf coaster with a flywheel launch that accelerated riders from 0 to 60 miles per hour in 4 seconds. Riders were sent through a 360 degree loop and into a vertical section of track, where they were then sent backwards through the loop. Although a short ride, the flywheel launch and vertical loop were coaster features that Astroworld had been missing from its lineup. The 1980s got off to a great start at Astroworld. General Manager Bill Crandall wanted to create a water attraction like no one had ever seen before. The result was Thunder River, a whitewater rapids ride that was extremely popular with park guests. Seated in circular rafts, guests floated through ravines and over rapids in a ride experience that made sure everyone got soaked. If the appearance of Thunder River seems familiar, it's because the ride's concept proved so popular it was duplicated at many other parks, and Rapids-type rides are still being built today. The concept may be nothing new by now, but it all started at Astro World. The Dexter Freebish electric roller ride was re-themed in 1981. It was given a medieval theme and renamed Excalibur. The park added to its lineup of thrill rides in 1983 with Sky Screamer, a first-generation Intamin drop tower. This specific type of drop tower differs from the more conventional drop towers of today due to its L-shaped layout. Riders were dropped from a height of 131 feet, where they experienced a g-force of 4.5. The tower's brake run placed riders on their backs, which only added to the ride's thrill factor. That year also brought about the closure of one of Astro World's original attractions, the Alpine Sleigh Ride. The ride was shut down, yet the mountain structure remained standing. Astro World received another new expansion in 1983, that of Six Flags Water World. Waterworld was Houston's first major water park and sat on land directly east of the amusement park. At the time of its opening, the only way to access Waterworld was to take the Astroworld train to the entrance, but eventually walkways were built. Waterworld featured such attractions as a wave pool, several body slides, a climbing structure and activity area, and even a raft slide that curved around and over Thunder River. Surprisingly, Waterworld was a separate admission price than that of Astroworld until 2002, when it was decided to give guests access to both parks with one ticket. Now featuring both a dry park and a water park, Astroworld had grown tremendously. The park garnered a reputation in the coming years as a sort of testing ground for new prototype rides. This reputation unofficially began with the opening of Thunder River. In 1984, Aero Huss constructed a new coaster at Astroworld, which was considered the first successful coaster of its kind. The company had previously constructed the Bat at Kings Island, but that ride was plagued with mechanical problems which led to it being dismantled after only three seasons. Aero Huss went back to the drawing board and created Accelerate, considered the first successful suspended swinging coaster. The concept is simple. The cars hang suspended beneath the track and are free to swing from side to side. This concept helped Accelerate become a new favorite at Astroworld despite the ride's low speed of only 34 miles per hour. Accelerate also had a second lift hill, uncommon on coasters at the time. The ride soon was repainted from its original blue and gray paint scheme to a much brighter blue and yellow. Several years later, Six Flags turned half the cars on the trains backwards, allowing riders to choose whether to ride the coaster forward or backward, each of which provided a different experience. It was also during this year that the Marvel McFay show left Astro World in favor of Six Flags' Looney Tunes show. The park's children's area was given plenty of theming to go along with this. It would be until 1989 that the park would receive its next coaster. Another Schwarzkopf coaster was built, called Viper. The coaster had previously been located at Six Flags St. Louis, where it was called Jet Screen, but it was moved to Astro World as part of their ride rotation program. During the relocation, Jet Screen was repainted from blue to a dark green, and a tunnel was added in closing the first drop. The tunnel had a simple painting of a dragon on the side, coinciding with its new name, Viper. Much like Greased Lightning, Viper featured a vertical loop, which was the only inversion on the ride. Its decent speed of 48 miles per hour made this a good intermediate coaster for younger riders. 
As if Astroworld didn't already have an impressive collection of coasters, a new one was built in 1990 that was like nothing ever seen before at the park. Ultra Twister was relocated from its previous home at Six Flags Great Adventure and immediately became the most popular ride at Astroworld. This coaster was manufactured by Togo and had the distinction of being the only Ultra Twister in the United States. Its cars were incapable of making any kind of turns, so the ride only traveled forwards and backwards. However, its thrills came from the three Heartline rolls that riders were put through at 44 miles per hour. Ultra Twister, much like the Texas Cyclone when it opened, was another ride that attracted people from all over the country, not just those from Houston. Astroworld was a valued member of the Six Flags family of parks, and had since been rebranded to Six Flags Astroworld, although the company kept the park's original name prominent in advertising. But Astroworld's story didn't end there. Check out part two of Six Flags Astroworld, a cyclone of thrills, to continue the story and learn about the park's final years. Thanks for watching, everybody. See you next time.